Behold the Lamb of God, John 1, verse 36. It is the preacher's principal business, I think I might say his only business, to cry, Behold the Lamb of God. For this reason was John born and sent into the world, and such were the prophecies which went before concerning him. If he had been the most eloquent preacher of repentance, if he had been the most earnest declaimer against the sins of the times, he would nevertheless have missed his life work if he had forgotten to say, Behold the Lamb of God. He did well when he baptised the repenting crowd. He spake nobly when he faced the Pharisees and was a true hero when he rebuked Herod. But after all, his chief errand was to herald the Messiah, to bear witness to the Son of God. What we have said of John, we may say of every God-sent minister. He is sent to bear witness to the Christ of God, and whatever else he may do, if he do not this continually, habitually, earnestly, he is not fulfilling the errand for which his master sent him, but has turned aside to baser ends. When any one of us who are called ministers shall die and come before the Lord to give in our account, it will be a sorry thing for us if we can only say, Lord, I have preached the dogmas of the church to which I belonged, unless we can also add that we have directed men to the living Saviour. Vain will it be to have argued with accurate logic and persuaded with lofty rhetoric unless we have uplifted Christ among the people. It will be idle to say, I have preached against the scepticism of the times, I have rebuked the sins which raged around me and have proclaimed what I knew of the glory of God in nature and in providence, for our chief and distinguishing work is to declare the name of the Lord Jesus and the power of his precious blood. As the stars called the pointers always point to the pole star, so must we always point to the Redeemer. Methinks the minister who has failed to cry, Behold the Lamb of God, may expect at the last to be cut in pieces and to have his portion with the tormentors. I can scarce conceive a doom too terrible for the man who dazzled his hearers with oratorical fireworks when he ought to have lifted up the cross and mocked immortal souls with the carved stone of his elocution when they were starving for the bread of heaven. Sermons without Christ condemn the preacher and delude the hearer. Sermons which do not point to Christ in them will be as hard to answer for as blasphemy or murder when the judge is on his great white throne. It is cruel to amuse with trifles those whose souls are in jeopardy of eternal fire. Playing with men's souls is murderous work, and truly if the Lamb of God be not preached, the ministry is playing with souls, if not worse. John, however, most thoroughly discharged his life work, for he was ever saying, Behold the Lamb of God. Notice in the text the attitude of the preacher, for it is very instructive. Looking upon Jesus as he walked, John said, Behold the Lamb of God. The preacher's eye should be upon his master while he points to his master. They preach Christ best who see him best. John had his own eyes fastened upon Jesus, and therefore did he, by his own example as well as by his word, say, Behold the Lamb of God. If you will take your place in a crowded street and stand for a few minutes looking at a certain object in the heavens or gaze upward as if something were there to be seen, you will soon find that without asking others to do the same, a company will gather around you and begin to look in the same direction. Indeed, a vast crowd might be collected by no other action than by you yourself gazing intently into the air. So John, in addition to his saying, Behold the Lamb of God, was doing the best thing to attract others to behold him, when he fixed his own eyes on Jesus with fixed wondering, admiring, adoring gaze. John had no eye for anyone but the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, and therefore his words had point and power in them. And note that John's eye was upon Christ, not only when Christ was coming to him, but as he walked by him. Well may the preacher have his master before him when his master is cheering him with his fellowship and honouring him with his presence. But on this occasion, Jesus was walking alone, as though in meditation, with his eyes probably bent upon the ground. It was not meet that he should always be coming to John. He had done that once, and so had put an honour upon his servant. But this time he came not to him, lest men should think that he had any dependence upon John, but he walked in quiet musing, 
as though his thoughts were otherwise occupied. Nevertheless, the Baptist had not forgotten his Lord, but again pointed him out. If the Lord denied to the preacher his comfortable presence, if no light of fellowship shine forth from the brow of the crucified, it is still ours, whenever and wherever we preach, to let the eye of faith realize Christ as present, and still to cry to others with a heart that palpitates in union with our words, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Even when I preach in chains, I would labor to honor Jesus, looking to him as the end and object of every word I utter. It is mine to preach a Saviour in whom I believe, whom, having not seen, I love. I am looking to him now for everything, even as I would have you do. I see in him superlative beauties which I wish you to see, and I worship a divinity in him which I desire you to worship. I preach not to you an unknown God or an untried Saviour. There is something notable in our text as to the hearers. This was a brief but weighty sermon, worthy to be preached a thousand times. Nobody needs a new sermon when, behold, the Lamb of God is the old one. John had delivered this same discourse before an assembled crowd, but now he had only two hearers, and these two were not unconverted persons. They were disciples of his own, and they were at least very near to the kingdom, if not already in it. Yet, to the solitary two, and those already discipled, he had only the same message to deliver. Behold the Lamb of God. He was a man of rich mind and ready utterance, yet he kept to his one point in all companies. It is thought that if we go into the theatre to preach to the mob, we must be sure to preach Christ. Let me ask you, what subject would be fitter for an assembly of saints? I pray you tell me. It has been said that he who preaches in the street ought to confine himself to the simple gospel. My brethren, in what place would that subject be inappropriate or unprofitable? Paul knew nothing among the Corinthians, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The resolve is a safe one for all companies. In this respect, some preachers know too much, and the sooner they join the holy know-nothings, the better. Christ is appropriate as a subject for two disciples as well as for a thousand scoffers. For while he is the resurrection to those who are dead, he is also the life of those who have been already quickened. No subject is more sweet, more refreshing, more inspiriting, more sanctifying to the saint than the cross of our dying Lord. The sinner needs it if he would be saved, but the saint requires it that he may persevere, advance, conquer and attain perfection. Give me that harp, and let my fingers never leave its strings, the harp whose strings resound the love of Christ alone. To harp upon the name of Jesus is the blessed monotony of a true ministry, a monotony more full of variety than all other subjects besides. When Jesus is the first, the midst, and the last, yea, all in all, then do we make full proof of our ministry. We do well when we are able to say, Of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. May Christ be all in all in all our ministries, for so shall we prove that God hath called us to testify concerning his Son, Jesus. I know I don't often begin these broadcasts with such a long reading, but I think if you want to get an insight into the heart of Spurgeon, if you want a window into the soul of this gospel preacher, that introduction to the sermon that was preached on July the 14th of 1872 couldn't be a a finer glimpse into the man's real heart. Behold, the Lamb of God is his great delight. This is the first sermon of this week's reading, number 1060, and we'll go through to 1066 this week. Next week you can join us for 1067 to 1073 with the featured sermon being 1072, My Prayer from Psalm 119. But all we're going to do in the time that remains to us is really to to follow Spurgeon in the, the trajectory of that introduction as he wants us to behold Jesus, knowing him to be the Lamb of God, and so be fully assured upon that point, heartily accepting the divine witness, then to contemplate him, 
humbly and attentively viewing him as the great propitiation, the true sacrifice for sin, then beholding him again to gather instruction from his appearance as the Lamb of God, and then to behold him with reverent adoration in his blessed capacity as the Lamb slain. And here is Spurgeon, in one sense, at his purest and finest. First, behold our Lord and learn that he is the Lamb of God. He is the chief of all sacrifices. All other sacrifices of God's ordaining were but pictures, representations, symbols and shadows of himself. There is only one sacrifice for sin. There never was another and there never can be. All those offerings under the Aaronic priesthood which were presented because of sin were only representations of the one sacrifice. They were that and nothing more. But, says Spurgeon, the blood of Jesus once presented has forever put away sin, and no further sin offering can be brought. Whoever resteth in Jesus as the true and only sacrifice is accepted in his faith. Spurgeon would have us grasp that Christ alone is the substance of everything that was only a shadow. He is the Lamb of the morning slain from before the foundation of the world and the Lamb of the evening offered up in these last days for his people. Thus might we speak of all other sacrifices and show that in Jesus they are all fulfilled. Atonement for sin is truly and in very deed to be found in the Son of God. In him alone is their remission, for in his blood alone is their efficacy to satisfy the law. Spurgeon then takes a moment to press that home. He, he wants us to see that because of the moral government of God, no sin can be put away without punishment. He's not saying here that the, uh, the cross of Christ is simply some demonstration of divine moral justice. It is a true atonement. But his point is that the Lord Jesus is of God appointed and provided to be the one vicarious sufferer, our second Adam, the true bearer away of the sin of the world by enduring its penalty in his own person so that whosoever believeth in him is redeemed from the punishment of sin. That, says Spurgeon, that itself is the gospel. I would sooner state it in the most simple language than have the power to deliver an impromptu poem, though it should excel the productions of Homer or Milton. There's more of precious truth and priceless learning in that faithful saying that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners than in the most profound discourse or the most stately epic. Be thankful then that you have heard it, he urges us, that there is forgiveness with God because Jesus Christ has become the saviour of men. He presses on to show us that this is the Lamb of God's appointing, that God from all eternity appointed the Lord Jesus. He was chosen and ordained to be the great sacrifice for sin. So was it decreed and written of him in the volume of the book, that oldest of books, I delight to do thy will, O God. Here is Christ Jesus then as the choice of the Father. Our hearts rejoice that it is so, says the preacher, for when we rely upon Jesus Christ to save us, we trust in one whom God has appointed to save his people. So God's appointment is the guarantee of the acceptance of everyone that believes in Jesus. And you can see here how he's beginning to heap up these excellencies of Jesus Christ as the sacrificed Lamb of God. He's of God's providing, and it endears Jesus to us to know that he's the dearest pledge of Jehovah's love to his chosen. Furthermore, he is of God's offering, says our preacher. Let us never forget that Jesus Christ was not presented to God by a human priest. There might then have been some mistake in the sacrifice. And Spurgeon's point here is not even that the Lord Jesus offered up himself, but that God himself had a hand in the sufferings of his Son. O oh, beloved, when I think of this, that God chose his Son to be the atonement, that he gave his Son, and then himself did, as it were, like another Abraham, offer up his own Isaac, I feel that the sacrifice must be acceptable and all-sufficient, so that he who rests in it need not have a shadow of a doubt, but that his soul is saved. So again, this fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God is our comfort, confidence, and consolation. This sacrifice, he goes on, is also of God's setting forth. When we, as God's ambassadors, tell you of Jesus Christ, we do so not in our own name, but we do our Lord's bidding, and God himself by us is setting Christ forth, showing him, revealing him, exhibiting him, and bidding you come to him. 
Spurgeon urges us from the character of God. There are no mockeries with him. He does not exhibit bread and refuse it to the hungry, or set raiment before the naked and refuse it to them. Happy are the men who see Jesus set forth manifestly crucified among them, for they have good ground to hope in him. And then here's the the application at the end of this first section. Sinner, look at this. Do you want to be rid of your sin? You're conscious of it this morning and you confess it with shame. Well then, God's way of pardoning you is that your sin be laid on Jesus. As far as you are concerned, you can obtain all the merit of the great atonement of Calvary by a simple act of faith. Is it in order that all things might be of God in this matter, from first to last, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Is not this well? Jesus is God's own chosen Saviour. What can be better? On what surer ground wouldst thou wish to rest? And here again is his heart poured out. I feel as if I could tarry here, pause here just a minute, and pass around among all this audience this one solemn question for each one to answer. Will you accept Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, to be unto thy soul the Lamb of God which takes away your sin? Come, what do you say? It is ours to point to him and to bear our witness. Will you accept our testimony? Truly, he is a great God and Saviour. We have trusted in him, and we are not confounded. But now, having set forth Christ and, uh, and said, in effect, I just want you to look at him and learn this truth about him, and you see something of Spurgeon's theological depth in that first thing. He wants us to contemplate Jesus under that character. Now, there's very subtle shifts or shades of meaning here. But what he wants us to do now is, having thought about Jesus as the Lamb of God, he wants us to contemplate Jesus as the Lamb of God. This is who he is, now in effect, dwell upon him. For Jesus Christ as the atoning sacrifice ought to be the principal object of every believer's thoughts. There are other subjects in the world which, which we must think of, for we're yet in the body. But this one subject ought to engross our souls, and as the birds fly to their nests, so ought we, whenever our minds are let loose, to fly back to Jesus Christ. To meditate then much upon the Lamb of God is to occupy your minds with the grandest subject of thought in the universe. All others are flat compared with it. What are the sciences but human ignorance set forth in order? That's a damning assessment, isn't it? What are the classics but the choicest of Babel's jargon when compared with his teachings? What are the poets but dreamers and philosophers but fools in his presence? Jesus alone is wisdom, beauty, eloquence and power. No theme for contemplation can at all equal this noblest of all topics, God allied to human nature, God the infinite incarnate among sons of men, God in union with humanity taking human sin, out of love stupendous condescending to be numbered with the transgressors and to suffer for sin that was not his own. O oh, wonder and romance, if men desire you, they may find you here. O oh, love, if men seek you, here alone they may behold you. O oh, wisdom, if men dig for you, here shall they discover your purest ore. O oh, happiness, if men pine for you, you dwell with the Christ of God, and they enjoy you who live in him. O oh, Lord Jesus, you are all we need. Again, this is not just pulpit rhetoric. This is the cry of the preacher's heart. He wants us to grasp that no subject so well balances the soul, stabilizes the soul as Jesus, the Lamb of God. Other themes disturb mental equilibrium and overload one faculty at the expense of others. Spurgeon says, pastorally, I've noticed in theology that certain brothers meditate almost exclusively upon doctrine, and I think it's not severely critical to say they have a tendency to become hard, rigid, far too militant. It is to be feared that some doctrinalists miss the spirit of Christ in fighting for the words of Christ. God forbid I should speak against earnestly contending for the true faith, but still without fellowship with the living Saviour, we may through controversy become ill-developed and one-sided. 
I think I've noticed that brothers who give all their thoughts to experience are also somewhat out of square. Some of them dwell upon the experience of human corruption until they acquire a melancholy temperament and are at the same time apt to censure those who enjoy the liberty of the children of God. Others turn all their attention to the brighter side of experience and these are not always free from the spirit of carnal security. So what's the remedy? Well, when a man takes Christ Jesus crucified to be his mind's main thought, he has all things in one, doctrine, experience, and practice combined. You have the Lamb of God in Christ Jesus, and it holds everything in its proper place. Then, this is the most needful subject of contemplation that can be brought before you. You may forget other things without serious damage, and even upon important matters you may somewhat err and yet be safe. But you must live upon Christ. Your souls must meditate on him, else you have left the bread from the feast and missed the water from the well. To live then for men is, as far as eternity is concerned, an unsatisfactory thing unless there be some higher light in which to view it. But when the heart lives for Jesus, it is not less philanthropic, for it loves men for his sake, but its object melts into the divine, for we love God when we love Jesus, since he is the very God of God. He, he has a shot against the deniers of our Lord's divinity. He says you, you, you might be an excellent Muslim or Jew or a pure theist, but you're not a Christian if you do not acknowledge Jesus Christ to be God and his atoning sacrifice denied is treason to the Lord of glory. Without a distinct and hearty recognition of our Lord's deity and atonement, how can a man be a partaker of Christ at all? True Christians about these truths have no question. Jesus is to them the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and the Son of God, whom the world shall yet adore. Now, let us pass on to a third run of thought, but indulge in it very briefly. I think, uh, as with this podcast, that lengthy introduction has taken up more time of Spurgeon's sermon than he'd anticipated. Let us behold the Lamb of God, he says, that is, gather instruction from Jesus under that aspect. So, doctrinal and experimental are the two main things here. Doctrinally, in terms of teaching, if the sacrifice provided by God for human sin must be none other than the Son of God himself, then sin is a gigantic evil, and then necessarily the punishment of sin is stupendous too. He says there's a, a painful attempt made to lower the meaning of Scripture upon the subject of the penalty due to sin. He says it's no longer uh, typically believed to be everlasting. But here's the logic. The moment we begin to mitigate our thought of hell's terrors, we also lower our idea of sin's evil, and with it we also decrease our estimate of the Saviour. All things in the temple of truth are to scale. Beautiful imagery. If you take the inch scale, which now seems to be getting popular, you diminish the dimensions throughout. A little hell involves a little atonement, but to be consistent, grant a divine saviour an infinite sacrifice, and you grant the infinite demerit of sin, and then the eternity of future punishment is seen to be consistent. So he says, everything here leans upon itself. Uplift the Christ of God and believe in the Lamb of God as none other than very God of very God and have him in high reverence, whatever that reverence may involve. What though your inmost soul be awed with the deepest dread and made to tremble at the fate of those who reject the Saviour and perish in their sins, yet seek not to save your feelings at your Saviour's cost. And then he says, what a conception of the love of God this gift of the Lord Jesus for our salvation gives us. Despite that terrible wrath of God against sin, he loved the sinner so much that he gave his only son to die for his redemption. This, then, is love. If you'd see the horror of sin, and if you'd see the hope of salvation, if you'd see the, the, the misery of of wickedness and the majesty of divine love. It must be through gazing upon Jesus as the Lamb of God. And furthermore, if you desire experimental aid, look to the Lamb of God also. That is, if you want your soul to be stirred and lifted up, is, is your heart troubled with sin? Well, don't meditate upon your sin. Behold the Lamb of God. 
sin vanishes when the Saviour appears. Are you tormented with the power of sin? Beloved, if you long to conquer sin within you, behold the Lamb of God. Crucified, your sin shall be upon that cross where Jesus died. Contemplations of the Saviour are the death of sin, but no other weapon will destroy them. And he goes on, if, if you're suffering from affliction, behold him. If you're weary in the battle of life and tired of serving God, behold the Lamb. Let not self-denial or self-sacrifice be hard, he pleads, when the Lamb of God is before you. Let not perseverance be difficult or shame or scorn be hard to endure or defeat or death itself be impossible to triumph in when the Lamb of God is before you. He conquered upon Golgotha, perhaps thou wilt only conquer there. Only keep thine eye upon the Lamb of God, he pleads, and this will make thee strong to do and to endure. He says, I, I could go on doing this, but I'm just going to add this one thing, that if at any time we grow discouraged about God's work and are afraid that it will not succeed and so on, the very best encouragement for us is to behold the Lamb of God. You get afraid that sin will conquer in your soul. How can it when Jesus died for you? Sin seemed to win the day when Christ was dead, but he rose again, and so shalt thou rise, and thou shalt be more than a conqueror. And here's the extrapolation. In this world, is it not a very weary business to be a minister of Christ today? If I might have my choice, I would sooner follow any avocation, as far as the comfort of it is concerned, than this of ministering to the sons of men. For we beat the air. This deaf generation will not hear us. What is this perverse generation the better for years and years of preaching? This is, the, this is the cry, remember, of a man who'd seen hundreds and thousands of people converted under his ministry. So we can say, yeah, we understand this. We can enter into this. Spurgeon goes on, the world's not worth the preaching to. We've piped unto it and it has not danced. We've mourned unto it, but it has not lamented. It wants an Elias, a man of fire and thunder to deal with such an age as this. But for all that, there is no room for discouragement, for the truth will win the day. It is in the hand of one who cannot fail or falter. He shall not fail or be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth and the isles wait for his law. The fight may seem to hang in the scales today, but the conquest is sure to come unto him whose right it is. He shall gather all the scepters of kings beneath his arm in one mighty sheaf and take their diadems from off their brows and be himself crowned with many crowns, for God hath said it, and heaven and earth shall pass away, but every promise of his must and shall be fulfilled. Push on then through hosts of enemies, ye warriors of the cross. Fight up the hill, ye soldiers of Christ, through the smoke and through the dust. Ye may not see your banner just now, neither do ye hear the trumpet that rings out the note of victory, but the mist shall clear away, and you shall gain the summit of the hill, and your foes shall fly before you, and the king himself shall come, and you shall be rewarded who have continued steadfast in his service. Ah, oh, it's wonderful stuff for a, a troubled and distressed servant of the Lord. It's just... It just fills your heart with hope to consider that this Jesus, this Lamb of God, this is the one who is able to, to lift up our hearts and in whose name we shall conquer. And because he's out of time, the last thought can only be this, behold the Lamb of God with reverence. I'll close as I began with a quote. I will not dwell upon it for I have not time. Lift up your eyes and worship him now. He exists. He is as truly there in heaven as he was here on earth. Behold him. Worship him. Trust him. Love him. For be this remembered, he will come ere long, and that which we shall have to dread if we are unbelievers will be the wrath of the Lamb. Read through the book of Revelation, and you shall find there, I think, more than twenty times the Lord described as a Lamb. The song is the song of Moses and the Lamb. Worship is given unto the Lamb, for he is worthy. He it is that takes the book and looses the seven seals thereof, and it is the Lamb that shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Wherefore, kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, while his wrath is kindled but a little. Worship him at this hour, for he cometh ere long. 
as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, he will summon every one of you to his bar. Take heed that he be not an object of terror to you, as he will be if you continue in unbelief, but turn unto him, that he may be your joy and gladness in the day of his appearing. Amen. That's a sermon from the heart of Spurgeon. I think it's perhaps one of the finest representations of what he is uh, and what he seeks to be as a minister of the gospel. And I trust it's been a blessing to you. It's what, as preachers, we should always be getting back to, what as hearers we should delight in and long for. Revelation, contemplation, instruction and adoration running on each other's heels in the ministry of the word and in the, the, the meditations of our own hearts. So please do come back and join us for more from the heart of Spurgeon next week. 1067 to 1073 of the sermons we'll be reading day by day and that featured sermon again 1072 entitled My Prayer. More of this and more like this at mediagratii.org slash podcasts. So do go there, do leave us a, a review, uh, do uh, give us a, a thumbs up or whatever it may be. It really does help and it often encourages. But may God above all bless you in beholding the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. been a blessing to you. It's what, as preachers, we should always be getting back to, what as hearers we should delight in and long for. Revelation, contemplation, instruction and adoration running on each other's heels in the ministry of the word and in the, the, the meditations of our own hearts. So please do come back and join us for more from the heart of Spurgeon next week. 1067 to 1073 of the sermons we'll be reading day by day and that featured sermon again 1072 entitled my prayer more of this and more like this at mediagratii.org slash podcasts so do go there do leave us a, a review uh, do uh, give us a, a thumbs up or whatever it may be it really does help and it often encourages but may god above all bless you in beholding the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.